Uh, well, we'll go ahead and get started then. So, hey, everyone uh, out there attending uh, of B-Sides uh, Salt Lake City, uh, thanks for having us. Welcome to our talk. This is uh, Gaining Clarity Within the Cloud, Sentinel Response Tactics for the Untrained and Unequipped. How's it going, everyone? My name is David Hall. I'm a senior cybersecurity customer engineer at Microsoft. Uh, in a former life, I was a signal warrant officer um, in the United States Army. That just means I'm not as cool as Nando. He was a cyber guy. I'm a signal guy. Uh, I'm also an automation enthusiast, so I, that just means I like PowerShell things, uh, ARM template type of things, BICEP, if you don't know what that is, ping me and I can walk you through what uh, BICEP is. Yeah, hey, and I'm Fernando Tomlinson. I'm a Principal Forensics and Incident Response Consultant at Mandiant. I too am a retired uh, Army Warrant Officer. Uh, shamelessly, now I don't want to say I'm a Cyber Warrant Officer, but <laughs> nonetheless uh, focused on cyber. I'm an adjunct cybersecurity professional or professor as well, and I'm an avid lover of PowerShell in the language. So we have an aggressive agenda uh, here today. So to kind of get us started off, we're going to talk about kind of level set with what is the cloud and kind of um, if you talk to probably six or eight or 12 or 37 different people, you may get 37 different answers about what is the cloud. So we'll kind of give you our rudimentary definition uh, about what is the cloud. We'll talk about some common mistakes that we see when we see customers move from um, on-prem to hybrid to more cloud-focused assets. Uh, talk about how we respond to incidents that occur as, of the, uh, as a result of those common mistakes. Some tools we can use to uh, do response actions um, as, a re as a result of those common mistakes. And then um, kind of what can we do proactively from an operations perspective? So I'm an operations guy uh, or sysadmin kind of background, whatever you want to call it. So what can we do proactively to not get ourselves in a situation where we need to, to do response actions? And then uh, at the very end, we'll talk about some quick wins and some uh, resources that you can use to skill up. And there it goes. So you've all probably seen this meme, ooh, the cloud, it's the, it's the cool thing that um, everybody talks about nowadays. And I guess if you're probably as, as old as I am, it is kind of new, relatively speaking, when you've been doing this for, um, what have I been doing this, 25 years or so? So it's been a while. Uh, the cloud is relatively new in, in those terms. Um, but the threats are really a lot of the same when you when you look at uh, the ingress points and kind of what we see as threat vectors for cloud assets versus on-prem. Um, the cloud really gives you some different capabilities, um, some different um, type of response actions and capabilities that you can use. So it's important to understand uh, that environment and kind of what it, it brings to bear. Uh, so we'll talk about that a little more in depth here in a minute. So kind of what our definition of the cloud is before we get too deep into the uh, security and IR type of stuff. Um, I kind of like to look at it as global infrastructure, globally connected infrastructure at your fingertips. So if I need to spin up a, a web application um, that's globally accessible to, to users in Australia or China or Russia or anywhere across the, across the globe, I can easily do that from the comfort of my home right here in, in coastal Georgia, you know, in less than seconds or minutes. It's just that easy. Those are, those are things that maybe 10 years ago or even three or four or five years ago with on-prem assets, you just didn't have access to. 
so the cloud gives you access to do that stuff at scale that you we just couldn't we just didn't think was capable of you know a few years ago that image there at the top right that's the the largest uh vm offering that i could find in in azure so 208 virtual cpus with a little over 11,000 gigs of ram i don't know what in the heck you would do with that thing but uh that's a pretty beefy machine that you could play like Minecraft or something on, I suppose. I have no idea what that would cost you, but um, it's probably out of my price range, I would guess. Uh, the cloud is also scalable. So, and very, very scalable, very, very quickly. So if during the holiday season, you're on TikTok and you make the latest viral video of whatever selling some kind of widget, uh on your website you could create uh you have your website in the cloud you can very easily scale those services to accommodate that 15 minutes of fame that you uh you realize during the holiday season that you need to accommodate with all that traffic that goes to your your website and then conversely you can very easily scale it back down so you don't have to realize all those expenses you know after january 1st when nobody's really looking at your your website anymore because the holidays are over so it gives you that flexibility uh from a security perspective again i come at this from uh the operations sysadmin side so in certain ways you can eliminate some of the security burden on your administrators. So if I look at this from a software as a service perspective, I can spin up uh, a SQL managed ins instance where I don't have to have a SQL server running. I can just run the SQL instance and I don't have to worry about patching a VM or patching a server or worry about any of that stuff running on. The I don't have to worry about the hardware period. All I have to worry about is the actual SQL piece of it and the application. So that's what the cloud um, gives us access to at this point in time. So when we talk about types of clouds, public cloud is pretty self-explanatory. That's that's what you see at portal.azure.com, at AWS, IBM, Oracle. That's all the public facing uh, clouds that really anybody has access to. Private cloud, here we're talking about um, when you're essentially creating your own data center and hosting services uh, privately that are not for public consumption. Hybrid services, this is where we see a lot of customers uh, today and are probably gonna be here for a long, long time. Um, customers have say an Active Directory instance on-prem and they are slowly moving web applications or some piece of that Active Directory infrastructure to the cloud. And, you know, that's probably not going to change anytime soon. Organizations are probably going to live in a hybrid, a, some sort of hybrid state for a long time. Community cloud, you may not have heard of. Uh, here we're talking about more of, say, uh, government specific clouds or healthcare specific clouds or financial specific clouds like Azure government, AWS has a government specific cloud and there may be others that I'm missing there. So you're the typical uh, cloud platform providers, this is in no way an exhaustive uh, list of course, but these are the, some of the major players. Um, some are much more mature than others. Of course, Amazon has, has been doing this really longer than, than anybody else on this list. And some of these uh, providers are what I would call more full service than others. Some of them are more uh, software as a service focused than full cloud platform providers. You know, which is better that's totally up to an organization to, to figure out. I, I would encourage you to dip your toe in a, into a little bit of everything and see what tool works for you the best. You know, the, the analogy I make is you go to the grocery store, there's probably 
seven different versions of barbecue sauce on the shelf. Which one's the best? Nah, I don't know. I mean, one of them may be better than the other in your opinion, but mine may be, one I get may be uh, better for me. So it's just a matter of which tool is better for you and your organization. And it may not be the same today uh, versus tomorrow. I think the takeaway here is the landscape is changing very quickly as it does uh, in this kind of ecosystem. You know, Amazon launched in, I think, 2006-ish. If my math is correct, that's, what, 15 years? We've only been doing this thing, doing this thing for about 15 years. So this thing is changing very quickly. There are new players coming into the game all the time. Uh, so kind of buckle your seatbelt, I think. So we've level set uh, about what the cloud is. You know, this is a, a security conference, right? What, what are we talking about the cloud? What about security? How do we um, secure these assets? What are some of the tools to do that? So what about security? So I have flapped my gums about, you know, the cloud. Let's get down to the meat and potatoes of why you're here. Uh, if you look at some statistics, now these are from our friends over at uh, Mandiant. Nando grabbed these for me. So if you look at the far left, 24% of organizations have hosts missing critical patches. So what's significant to that for me in relation to the cloud? Uh, and we see this all the time at Microsoft. If you have a bad patching program on premise, it's going to follow you into the cloud. If it causes you problems on premise, it's going to cause you those same problems in the cloud. Uh, so I think that the takeaway with that is uh, one, fix the problem before you start moving those assets to the cloud. So do some inventory there before uh, you start lifting, shifting assets uh, and moving them to the cloud. The cloud is in no way some sort of um, magic elixir to fix all of your uh, security woes. It's not gonna do that for you. Uh, all of that stuff that you needed to do on, on premises, you're gonna need to do that in the cloud as well and more so. Uh, if you take a look at that second statistic there, 95% of the security failure failures that customers uh, is the customer's responsibility. So I think that goes to, this is not necessarily um, fully understanding what is service provider's responsibility and what is the uh, data owner's responsibility. So it's, it's incumbent upon the data owner to understand from a security perspective, what is their responsibility versus what is the cloud provider's responsibility? Uh, if we look at the, the third one there, 84% of organizations say traditional tech doesn't work in the cloud. Uh, again, this goes back to understanding what you're lifting and shifting or what you're moving from on-prem to a hybrid or cloud only um, model. So you may have tools, security tools specifically on-prem that are not gonna reach your assets in the cloud or reach assets that you intend to have in multi-clouds. So that is a, a big consideration when you think about um, going from a specifically on-prem model to potentially hybrid or totally cloud facing. So understand that your tools need to be able to reach all those assets. Cloud is not going anywhere. So that number on the right-hand side, 11% have a significant cloud component. Cloud's not going anywhere. I, I would expect that number to go up as, as time goes on. Uh, the takeaway here is not all tools are cre created equal and not all tools are going to cover all assets. So do your homework before you lift and shift your assets to the cloud. 
So some common misconfigurations we see. Now these are Azure specific, obviously, but I would expect uh, to see some commonality, commonalities across cloud providers uh, with some of these. I haven't looked specifically, but you, Trend Micro probably has uh, some of these same things for other cloud providers in that link below. So storage accounts in, um, in Azure, we see commonly storage accounts left open with um, secure transfer not enabled is very common, public access left enabled, um, VNet access left you know, wide open, those kinds of things for the VMs, um, extensions, just approval for any type of extension running, leaving RDP open, um, those types of things. For network security groups specifically, just turning on a security group and leaving the default uh, rule set there. It's just like, you know, kind of any, any firewall rule set or anything that similar capability you have to pare that rule set down to, to make it, you know, useful. So it's just like anything else. You have to do your homework. Um, and we're going to talk about some tools that you can use to mitigate some of these things uh, right off the bat, because a lot of this is you don't know what you don't know before you get in the cloud, right? So common root cause, and I think this is number one right at the top, is just lack of understanding. It's it's a don't, it's a you don't know what you don't know. Um, we're all trying to move at the speed of sound because uh, your organization is trying to, you know, make money or do whatever they do, and we're all trying to do it fast and efficiently uh, and get it done yesterday. So a, a move from on-prem to hybrid or to cloud is in no way different. Uh, and having been in, you know, grown up in the government most of my adult life, being in the commercial world is no different. You're probably undermanned and understaffed and overworked, and you're probably doing more than you are paid to do. So lack of understanding of an environment is not uncommon across all customers that, that I see on a daily basis everywhere. Um, so what can you do from your sphere of influence to, to mitigate some of that? And I think what we're gonna talk about on the next few slides and uh, what Nando is gonna talk about, you have to, take a step back and automate things. You have to automate what you can to take control of the potential sprawl that you can get from having to deploy these resources so quickly. Uh, you can quickly go from zero to 60, and then you find yourself in a situation where you're circling back and trying to put some guardrails on it all. So you don't wanna be in that situation. So from an operations support perspective, and I kind of lump, you know, your sysadmins folks into that kind of mindset. What can you do to assist your cyber teams, your blue teams, your red teams, your purple teams, whatever color you want to you want to throw in there? What can you do proactively to assist? so we don't have to go through the incident response drill. So maybe we can stop some of this before it actually happens. I think we can change the way we think, we can change our approach, and that will change the way that we defend the infrastructure. If we assume the attacker is in the network, assume on a day-to-day -day basis that everything that we have put in place has failed. You can't uh, nowadays think that there is a perimeter defense. There really is no perimeter defense. There's no firewall. There's you, you can't really put up a firewall or an IPS or an IDS 
or you know a moat and fill it with alligators and think that that is going to keep the threat actor out of the network is just not possible anymore identity is the perimeter uh that's the ingress point for almost all of these these threats so you kind of have to think about it in terms of there is no wall in between your infrastructure and the the threat actors the bad guys it's kind of an imaginary line at this point so if we can assume breach we start thinking about all those speed bumps that the fence in depth all of those things the speed bumps that we can put in front of an attacker and then the, at the end of the day it's all about increasing the attackers uh, or decreasing the, the attacker's return on investment. We want to make it as hard as possible for an attacker to do what they want to do. We want to make it cost as much as possible for them to get in the infrastructure and do what they want to do. Uh, if it's easy for them to walk in the front door or the back door or the side door, uh, you know, then they just kind of have free reign and to do whatever they want to do. And odds are you probably won't know it until it's too late. So we want to assume breach, put as many speed bumps in the way as possible, uh, decrease the attacker's return on investment, increase their cost of attack, and eventually we want to get to a zero trust model. So this is kind of like uh, the definition of the cloud. You know, what the heck is zero trust? Well, if you ask 10 people, you're going to get 27 different answers. Well, I figured NIST was probably a good source on this. So what what is zero trust? Well, if you're a basically a comprehensive strategy to secure your organization or organization's enterprise anywhere, anytime. That's essentially zero trust. So whether your users are accessing your corporate infrastructure from home, from B-side Salt Lake City, from inside the corporate network, via a mobile device, uh, via a corporate owned device via a work from home device, whatever it is, we want to have all the zero trust uh, guardrails and conditional access and all those things in place uh, to be able to protect the network and infrastructure uh, to head off attacks before we get to instant response. So what are some uh, mechanisms we can use cloud specifically to, to do some analysis, to do some administration, those kinds of things. Now, these are in kind of my order of effectiveness. Your mileage may vary here. This is Azure specific, obviously, but I think, you know, AWS has some Cloud Shell equivalent. Azure Cloud Shell is essentially PowerShell built into the Azure web interface. I like it because it's OS agnostic. You don't have to, if you're using it from uh, Linux or Mac, you know, no big deal. Second, uh, kind of in the list there is PowerShell because it's command line uh, interface. It is cross-platform to a degree. The, the, uh, the engine is cross-platform. Some of the tools that, that you're trying to do, use, the modules, may or may not be so your mileage may vary there there are version there is some versioning and os considerations uh there with what kind of what versions of powershell you're using the web uh ui is good to get started in my opinion it's not sustainable you can't uh efficiently manage cloud infrastructure doing it in the in the web ui you you just can't. You don't have access to, to do that stuff efficiently. Um, you're going to quickly be overwhelmed. Uh, it's just not sustainable. So take away there. Get out of the web GUI. Get into the command line. So in that kind of same vein, this is one of the things that you can do from an operations perspective 
is utilize infrastructure as code methodologies to deploy and maintain your resources. So what do I mean by infrastructure as code? I want to put all of my, I'm gonna deploy my VMs, I'm gonna deploy my web apps as code. Uh, now this is what kind of the, the infrastructure as code, an example looks like on the bottom right there. That is actually bicep code. If any of you are familiar with uh, ARM templates, Azure Resource Manager templates based on JSON, this is kind of the next generation uh, language of ARM. It's a transpilation language on top of ARM. So if you're familiar with JSON, to me, it kind of makes your eyes bleed with all the punctuate, punctuation. Uh, this is BICEP meant to make the barrier to entry for ARM templates much less. Um, it's so easy. I did this, you know, I'm not, Nando can attest, I'm not a very smart guy. I actually put one of these things together. So, you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, anyway, infrastructure is code. What we're trying to get to is deployment efficiency, recoverability. So if, a ransomware attack happens, we can quickly recover. All we need to do is pull our resources out of code. Uh, now, obviously there's a lot of intricacies and nuance there, but you get the idea. It enables us to do automated scanning, avoid configuration drift. We, we can um, dynamic provision. So if I have a lab, I need to move from my dev test environment over to production. I can do that. All I need to do is flip a switch in the code. It takes 20 seconds. Um, I can automate documentation. I don't have to spend a bunch of time writing Word documents. I can do it all in Markdown as a part of deployment with uh, infrastructure with code methodologies. So those are kind of some of the things that you can unblock as you're moving from on-prem to uh, in the cloud. So think about those kinds of things and I'll pass it over to Nando to take us a little further. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, everything Dave is talking about is, is truly spot on and things that, um, you know, we kind of deal with on a daily basis, if you will. So, you know, due to those things, well, the need for incident response is certainly vital. It isn't truly a matter of if, it's really a matter of when. So like this picture, it's understood that some things just happen, right? And sometimes we can see it coming. And at that point, we become reactive in nature. And where we don't like to become reactive in nature, if you will, or try to, to, to limit that, well, in that case, we, we try to put together a plan. And sometimes that plan doesn't go as desired. Um, and we still just have to react. In either situation or really case, it truly highlights and really strengthens the need for incident response. This is more true of the digital environment, especially when we think about how we do it on-prem and even more so as we look at the significant shift to uh, cloud infrastructure. So what is this whole incident response? Well, when I look at the how when I look at how three well-known organizations define incident response, they all are truly saying something different in terms of words, specifically on the screen, uh, but they're all truly saying the same thing. At the core, right, one would call incident response the act of maybe responding to something, to be able to contain a threat, if you will, um, minimize an impact, and certainly bring an organization back to, to steady state. And the way we get after that is truly we have some type of framework or a subset of phases. And generally, when we think about incident response phases, well, what comes to mind is NIST, right? National Institute of Standard and Technology, or SANS, right? Sysadmin Audit Network Security. Most people don't think about it from that perspective. But while it looks like they're two different things, and they truly are, or really that the phases are different, um, they're largely the same, right? So the NIST one obviously is four steps where SANS is, is six steps. But from the perspective of where they, they nest together, 
Uh, we kind of see it like, like that, right? So from a prep perspective, we're thinking about training and exercises and playbooks and, you know, how are we going to communicate with people in band and out of band, if you will. From, from an identification standpoint, um, you know, we're thinking about being able to identify malicious activity or really anomalies and being able to look for indicators or maybe behavior-based um, things. We're looking at our perimeter and inside the perimeter, or in the case of cloud, we're looking at identities and how they typically um, flow or, or uh, authenticate within the network and what they're truly used for. Now, when we get to the point of actually identifying that something has actually happened, well, then we certainly need to be able to contain it, limit its ability to really go further beyond what it's already um, done and gone. In some cases, that's you know affecting ACLs or NSG within uh, our cloud environment, being able to really uh, prevent an attacker or an actor from being able to leverage what they've been leveraging thus far. And then you kind of want to look to, to eradicate them, right? Right. So essentially phase out uh, the attacker activities and their ability to um, certainly uh, come back. Um, this could be uh, maybe applying some different firewalls, fixing the misconfigurations that, that Dave has highlighted that are generally set within our cloud environment and a substantial of other things. The recovery aspect, well, kind of straightforward there. We're trying to bring uh, our systems um, certainly back online, monitor them for a period of time uh, in a phased approach uh, to make sure we have truly um, rid the adversary of, uh, of their actions and really what they've done within our network. And the lessons learned aspect, this is where some of that infrastructure is code that Dave talked about um, can help us in a sense of, hey, let's incorporate that in our playbook. But certainly from the perspective of, of recovery, we'd be able to utilize some of that infrastructure as code. Now, that's a lot, right? But from this perspective, we really want to focus on kind of three things as far as what would be a benefit to you. And that's the identification aspect, containment, eradication, right? Detection analysis, if you will, if you're looking from a NIST perspective. At large, the methodology of how to do it on-prem um, in the cloud in some respect is laid out, right? What, what should be done kind of at each step or what the focus area should be is, is somewhat fleshed out. Historically though, uh, when we look at incident response on premises or like on-prem systems, um, naturally people understood that better because we've had years and substantial, and substantial amount of time to really perfect that. The cloud aspect is where it really gets a little gray for people, right? As Dave talked about having that, that firewall, that moat, right? People tend to cut themselves off from the internet, if you will, um, at some point to then remediate it. That's a little bit different when we think about um, doing this from a cloud perspective. So as we look at some of these tools and capabilities and things to really help you, uh, this is a good opportun opportunity for us to really share our disclaimer, right? So for some people, this will be TLDR, uh, i.e. too long, um, didn't read, or it might be TSCR, which is too small, couldn't read. So let me give you kind of the cliff notes, if you will, associated with this. Um, we're not saying that the tools that we'll talk about are the only capabilities that are available for cloud analysis, detection, response, but we're certainly highlighting a couple of things that could be of use to you if you're a manager or really a, an engineer, a responsible entity, um, security guy, responsible person for a cloud environment. All right, so sorry about that. I was having a fight with the mute button. All right, so one of these tools we'll talk about is Azure specific, but it can reach across different clouds. So if you have assets in, well, even on-prem, if you have assets on-prem in Azure, other clouds, uh, Defender for Cloud is a security posture management threat protection product uh, that you can use to maintain a high level of security once you have assets kind of all over the place. So Defender for Cloud will uh, use Azure security benchmarks to 
look at a subset of assets uh, and give you secure score. Um, and it'll also give you remediation activities that you can take on uh, assets to improve your secure score. So as an example, uh, we talked about storage accounts are commonly misconfigured in, in Azure. Uh, Defender for Cloud may look at your storage account and see that public access uh, is still enabled for your storage account. It'll surface that in Defender for Cloud and give you the remediation activities uh, to quickly remedy that. So just one of the tools that you can use um, in Azure to, to get at some of this stuff before it becomes a huge problem down the road. Yeah, so you know that's very interesting, specifically when we look at some of the other things that we can do. And one of those other things that we can do are honey tokens, right? So from an identification standpoint, the use of them is certainly great. When we think of honey tokens, um, it's really referred to as canary token, if you will, because they are like a canary in a coal mine, but really in reverse. Um, but this can be a piece of information that allows you to implant a trap in a system. Uh, this could be a file, could be a fake uh, system itself, could be a fake user service account, right? It's really just something that certainly is enticing. So that being said, we want to make sure that uh, it is enticing to an attacker because if not, then, well, it's not going to really be of use to you. We want the attacker to find it certainly worthwhile. We want them to not only find it, but trigger the use of accessing uh, that token. Uh, whatever it is, it should be certainly highly uh, monitored to be able to illuminate potential adversary activity. If the use of the uh, token goes unnoticed, well, then it certainly starts to defeat uh, the purpose, right? And if these tokens um, have some form of value and they get compromised and we're not able to illuminate that, well, then it could certainly be a bad day um, for us. Now, when we look at different capabilities, right, we'll, we'll talk about four specifically. Uh, that's going to be Mandiant's a uh, Azure AD Investigator, uh, Invoke AZ Explorer, Hawk, and Sparrow. So what are these things? Well, the Mandiant tool capability is really uh, used to detect possible UNC 2452 activity. And if you're not familiar with UNC 2452, that's a, a cluster of activity that from the Mandiant perspective, we have linked to um, uh, Rus Russian actors, if you will. Um, and namely, this kind of came about when we looked at uh, solar winds, right? So that was solar winds moving on to uh, cloud infrastructure, and that's where that really where that came about. So there's a lot of indicators that are in there, uh, a lot of which are high fidelity, meaning when you see um, them being triggered, um, there's some high likelihood that it is associated um, likely with this group. There are also some indicators that are in there that are dual use in nature. So from that perspective, if you see them being used, it could be adversary activity, but it also could be related to legitimate functionality from an admin or some user, right? So those don't give you such a high fidelity, but certainly are worthwhile looking into. Every capability that's inherent in this tool does a best effort job, if you will, at identifying indicators of compromise that will certainly require further verification and analysis. Now, with that, what it will not do is certainly identify 100% of the time, um, you know, malicious activity in your environment, nor will it always tell you if an artifact is legitimate admin activity or a threat actor activity. So it does require some human interaction, some analysis from your perspective, but it will do a good job of highlighting. Some of the things that it brings to light for you, well, signing certificates with an unusual validity period, specifically if uh, the certificate has a, a time frame associated with it longer than a year, uh, that may be certainly worth um, looking into. Uh, signing certificate mismatches, right? So when we think about federated domains where the issuer or the subject of the signing certificate does not match, that may be certainly worth looking into as well. Uh, Azure AD backdoors, right? Thinking about it from a federated domain perspective as well. Um, a list of federated domains. Maybe you're not fully aware of 
uh, domains that are federated within your environment or that have a communication with such, and then unverified domains, right? So all of these things are certainly worthwhile for, for you to consider and look at. And really this tool helps to uh, bring the focus area to a number of things that are uh, time well spent should you um, look at them. Invoke AZ Explorer. Well, this is a capability that I ended up writing during the whole time of SolarWinds as well. So this is going to retrieve vital information that would be useful to you during an intrusion. It's written specifically for Azure and O365 environments. And some of the information that it retrieves for you are things about the domain, the users, the groups, SAML tokens, applications and the permissions associated with those applications. Like the previous tool, it's not gonna fully give you 100% saying this is bad, but it will prov uh, provide you with a subset of data um, that is certainly worth your time to do analysis on. That could very well be interesting in nature. The next tool, Hawk. It provides limited analysis on gather gathered data uh, it's really there to help you get all the data in a single place. It is by no way, form or fashion designed to make any significant conclusions about the data that it uh, gets for you. Uh, from their perspective, it's impossible to know everything about your environment, to know what you should be concerned with or not be concerned with, to then further on make a legitimate analysis or best guess about the data. That seems to be a common theme here as, as we move forward, right? Uh, Hawk's goal is certainly to uh, quickly get you the data that you need to be able to, to draw your conclusion and not make the conclusion for you. So again, everybody's environment is certainly different, but being able to get the relevant data in one place in a good pane of glass that you, an analyst or somebody can make sense of very quickly it is key. And that's what this tool, like the other two, um, do for you. Sparrow, well, it's yet another PowerShell script that looks for anomalies and unusual activity by verifying unified Azure and M365 audit logs, looking for a known list of indicators of compromise. It lists Azure AD domains and checks Azure service principles and their Microsoft Graph API permissions. Why? Because this has been something that has um, certainly been of interest to malicious actors in the past and certainly tactics, techniques that they look to abuse um, even today as they have done in the past and likely will continue to do it in the future as well. This tool is intended for use by incident responders and was truly built by the cloud forensics team at CISA. Uh, their focus is really to help narrow the scope of user and application activity as it uh, pertains to identity and authentication based attacks that has been recently uh, seen in multiple sectors. So yet another tool uh, that was derived based upon firsthand accounts uh, in the field and what they're seeing. It's not made to be a comprehensive or exhaustive list of available data, right? Because again, going back to every environment is different but it is certainly intended to narrow a larger set of data sets uh, to help you in your investigation and your analysis and really help with the um, scalability and really, I'm sorry, not really scalability up, but narrowing of the telemetry associated with what's happening in your environment. So, you know, when we look at an analysis process, right, at a very, very high level, um, if you're in your environment and, you know, you may not fully understand what license you have and, and what that enables and affords you to have access to, well, you can utilize the Azure CLI, as Dave mentioned earlier, and you can, um, you know, uh, well, actually PowerShell in this case, uh, apologies, and actually do get AZ uh, resource. And that'll tell you everything um, from a resource perspective that's available to you within uh, your subscription. If you're looking at some hunting queries or reconnaissance queries, there's a good list that are already made and developed for Azure. Uh, and then there's some for M365. Certainly appreciate Microsoft's uh, help with the M365 perspective. Is it an all encompassing list? Probably, probably not, right? Depends on your environment, but it is certainly a good starting point for you to look at common things that could be abused or 
accessed by attackers and then build upon them based upon your network and the way things are set up. If you're already comfortable with doing analysis from an on-prem perspective in terms of dead box analysis, well, you could be able um, to export uh, you know, the disk or the VM associated with whatever you have uh, in the cloud. So uh, within our, our infrastructure, we'd be able to go all services, compute, disk, disk export. If we wanna be able to export a disk, we'd select which one uh, we're concerned with. And if we're talking about virtual machines, uh, we can do nearly the same thing in that aspect. And then once we have that, we can utilize things that maybe we're comfortable with, maybe FTK or NCASE or autopsy, right, or X-Waves or something like that. But that leads you to leads you back to a, a familiar state if you're used to doing it from an on-prem perspective. Okay, so looking at a, a scenario of sorts, let's say you want to look at investigating specific activity uh, within Azure, right? So in this case, the main source would be um, activity logs, and we would utilize the Azure CLI. From that perspective, we would list uh, any uh, events that would be available to us to actually query, right? And I, I've listed the command that we could use so that way you walk away with something. Um, and then if we have an idea as to what user it was, we could then utilize a query to look at events associated with the particular user. From there, we might say, hey, well, this IP address is interesting. Where else does it appear in here? Where are the events that uh, are incorporate that IP address? Well, we would then be able to query specifically for that. If we're interested about the last 500, 10 events, five, whatever number of events within the last hour, well, we could query and return that as well. And if we're worried about events that happened last week, the week before, or on a particular date, so long as the retention period has not passed, uh, well, we could do that as well. So from this perspective, I'm looking at events that took place on November 12th, and subsequently the uh, three days that followed that. So November 12th to uh, November 15th. But again, not all encompassing, but certainly uh, an available capability at a raw perspective to be able to get the data that you need, right? The way that you would look at this and frame it from an on-prem perspective, you're still focused on a user. In this case, we're focused on an identity. We're still focused on a time frame when we're looking at stuff on-prem. Well, this is how we can look to do that uh, from a cloud perspective. All right, so you know, there's not enough time for us to talk about cloud you know, uh, at large in a, a, a one hour talk, if you will. But here's some easy reading, some tangibles that you can take away with you, aside from the, the couple of tools that we just mentioned and capabilities, some easy reading, if you will. So Mandy and producers of the white paper will do it uh, pretty periodically in terms of um, in a technical nature, really more of a tactical guide, talking about remediation and hardening strategies for M365. Specifically, how do you defend against uh, that UNC2452 that I talked about earlier, who, again, is still very active uh, today. This is talking about uh, some attack techniques right, to be able to then help you understand what they're leveraging, but then some things that you could do um, to kind of uh, deflect that, to mitigate that, if you will. Our friends at Microsoft, well, be it that it's their technology that we're talking about today, they also produce a very robust report that is certainly easy on the eyes and brain to read, uh, talking about cybercrime at large and their tech, um, and focusing on and talking about cloud and how it's being abused in that manner. That also is done periodically as well and certainly worth the read. So you have an entity that builds the tech and is certainly uh, stepped up to the plate in terms of defending it. And then you have something from an organization that certainly is also on the front lines of uh, defending, illuminating, um, doing analysis against this tech on a daily basis. Um, so um, great assets and great things to walk away with. So what can you do today to, to put some uh, those speed bumps we talked about earlier in place? So maybe we can 
mitigate some of this before we get to the incident response phase. Uh, now, these are things that we talk about to customers on a regular basis, all day, every day. Uh, first one there, now these are not in any kind of certain order. Uh, obviously, each organization would have to prioritize these based on a myriad of things, time, money, knowledge base of you know, the people that work there, all those things. Uh, but use of a privileged access workstation, if you don't know what that is, there are free documents out there uh, that will basically walk you through how to stand one up. But essentially, if your administrators are doing any type of privilege access on on-prem assets or cloud assets, doesn't really matter. They need to be doing it from a clean keyboard to prevent uh, cash credentials and uh, credential theft and those kinds of things. Next one, multi-factor authentication. Uh, you've all probably heard of that. It's just one of those things you need to enable at the very, very least on your administrator accounts, but if at all possible on all accounts. Uh, exclude that break glass account, otherwise you won't get into to, uh, your cloud assets if MFA is not functioning properly. Conditional access, this is one of those things that cloud uh, gives you the capability to do. So use it to the fullest capability you can. Um, gives you the, the possibilities of restricting uh, logins from you know, certain versions of Android, or if they come from certain regions of the world, uh, all those kinds of things. There's so many things that you can do with conditional access, take advantage of it. Uh, just in time access, you want to eliminate as many standing privilege accounts in domain admins and global admins and, and all those privilege groups that you can use uh, privilege identity management or some other tool. There are plenty of tools out there that do this uh, that will allow you to do just-in-time privilege access uh, in your organization. Be careful if you have a hybrid environment. Again, a lot of organizations are going to be in some, of, some type of hybrid uh, mode for probably a long, long time. Careful what you're syncing from any type of on-prem directory to the cloud. You don't want to sync any type of privilege user from the on-prem to uh, the cloud. That just opens up pivot points for uh, threat actors. Some more kind of O365 or M365 uh, specific. If someone is doing a content search outside of administrators, it's probably uh, someone that is not wishing you well. So let's configure some type of alert activity on that. Uh, that's number one there. Uh, again, we talked about the ingress points. Identity uh, is essentially your perimeter today. Uh, who has the identities that's your users? What is their primary means of communication today? Email. Uh, so turn on all the end of malware, spam, transport controls, all that stuff that you can do to, to mitigate all the, the normal email, you know, ingress points. Um, disable any kind of storage provider you don't need for OWA. So if you don't need anything additional to OneDrive or Box or Dropbox or whatever, disable the rest of them. Auditing, I think it goes without saying, enable all the auditing you can. Obviously, um, auditing is no good unless you can synthesize it and make sense of it and actually action it when, you know, something pops up in the auditing. So it, it doesn't really do a whole lot of good if you're enabling it and nobody's, you know, making sense of it. Uh, but generally speaking, more auditing, equals more better. So some of the things that you can, uh, some resources here that you can use to uh, skill up, learn.microsoft.com has all kinds of free resources that you can use to train up on really any of our um, technology 
a lot of it that requires it gives you access to free sandbox tenants. So there's really no barrier entry as far as any kind of um, Microsoft technology goes. Uh, if you're not familiar with John Savile, he does hours and hours and hours of free content on YouTube related to automation, PowerShell and security and Azure and all kinds of other things. Um, a cloud guru is a, uh, online training platform similar to like uh, Pluralsight and there are others, and there are plenty of others, uh, but there are a multitude of resources out there. Uh, and if you can't find one, you know, our slide with all of our contact information is coming up. Feel free to, to reach out to myself or Hernando and we'll do what we can to, to hook you up with some sort of resource. So, kind of synthesizing everything we, we talked about here. Um, again, the cloud is no silver bullet to securing your assets. Uh, it's no magic elixir. Anything that you're doing on-prem from a security perspective, you should definitely carry that forward uh, as far as policies and procedures go. Um, some defense tactics on-prem are going to just differ in the cloud because the the threat landscape is a little different uh, and we talked about some of that stuff i just talked about logging enable all of that stuff through all your, your cloud assets um, obviously if you can't synthesize it it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense but you have to take into account all of those cloud assets uh, in addition to your on-prem stuff Restrict those privilege accounts, include uh, all of those privilege accounts that are in your cloud directory as well. Uh, global admins and security admins and all those. And utilize all those tools, Honey Tokens and, and all of those, um, those tools that we talked about. Everything at your disposal and utilize what you can uh, because it's not gonna get any easier. Um, and utilize your network, like things like this today, uh, you can use to grow your network and, and feel free to reach out to, to your peers and people like me, you know, reach out to me if you have questions that maybe I can answer. You know, like I alluded to earlier, I'm not the smartest guy, but I know people like Nando and, and other people that we can put you in, in contact with that, that do know things that I don't know. So uh, absolutely feel free to reach out to me if you have a question. All right. Hey, and with that, we, we appreciate everybody uh, for joining in today. Um, if you want to connect with us, we're, you know, available on Twitter. We're, we're humans just like you. Uh, specifically, if you're into technology, we are as well. So we would love to continue the conversation. Uh, Dave and I like to produce tools in an array of languages, and it does us no good to keep them all bottled up to ourselves. So where we can um, get them outside of our employer, uh, we like to post them on GitHub. So um, feel free to connect with us there as well. The buffer inside our head is also small. So we need to be able to write stuff down. That being said, we each have a blog and that's where we like to put our, our thoughts to paper, if you will, things that we can't contain inside. With that, again, we sincerely appreciate the opportunity to speak here and be uh, here at uh, Beside Salt Lake City. With that, uh, we look forward to future conversations and, and really just looking to increase and really decrease rather our attack surface associated with cloud infrastructure. Thanks everyone. Thanks for having us Salt Lake.